Hello and good evening. It's now 1905 in London. I'm Nikki Scott. And I'm Luke Addison. And welcome to welcome Together to Talk. Together Talk. <laughs> we had such a great time with Virginia McKenna and Will Travers last week, didn't we, Luke? As they yes. brought us up to speed on all that the Born Free Foundation are doing for animals across the world. What fantastic work they do. And I hope that it inspired lots of you to have a look at their website and continue to follow their journey. If you missed it or any of the other talks of series two, don't forget you can still watch them on demand on YouTube by searching Together Talks. It really was an unforgettable evening. And now for our guest tonight, we have Daniel Flynn, the chief visionary and co-founder of Thank You, an organization aiming to change the world by changing the system. Thank You's mission statement is, amplifying impactful change makers to better serve people living in extreme poverty by redistributing wealth from consumer spending, which sounds like a truly ambitious and much needed approach. So now let us welcome Daniel Flynn's intro video, which will tell us all about what we need to do as consumers to help end poverty. Hey guys, my name is Daniel Flynn and I'm one of the co-founders of Thank You. Uh, we're a social enterprise uh, that sells consumer product that exists all for the end of extreme poverty. Uh, I am a proud dad of uh, my son, Jedediah, who's five. Uh, I have a daughter on the way uh, to about two months away from holding a daughter in my hand. I'm married to uh, my incredible wife, Justine, who is also um, my co-founder at Thank You. We started when we were like 19, 21 years old. And we had this idea. Our world has two extremes. Extreme poverty. Today, the 736 million people living in extreme poverty. And then extreme consumerism. Uh, the... <laughs> okay, speaking of Jed. Hey, buddy. Hey, thank you. Pancake. Pancake. All right. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to use this edit, but uh, extreme poverty and extreme consumerism. That was Jed. Um, I love 2020 and I love that family is just one thing now. But extreme consumerism, like this coffee or, or anything, the products that we buy and choose, we spend $53 trillion a year as consumers. And in that same world, 736 million people don't have access to basic human rights. And thank you as a bridge between the two. We sell over 50 consumer products like hand wash and hand sanitizer. Um, we've raised... Uh, from the sales here in Australia and New Zealand, over $17 million. And I just look forward to sharing our story, uh, what's worked, what hasn't, and what you can hopefully take for your chapter as you help right wrongs in this world. There is inequality in every country, uh, on every street, and this pandemic has only shone a light on that even brighter. So it's going to take change from all of us, um, but you know we're going to share, uh, and I'm going to share, uh, I think what we've learned and, uh, and look, hopefully you walk away with that. I'm going to get into my coffee uh, and, and we're going to have some fun. So thank you. Well, that was just charming. I love the fact that Jedi joined in there, did a little Zoom bomb. Um, so with no further ado, let's Zoom Daniel Flynn all the way in from Victoria, Australia. Come on down, Daniel. Hey guys, how you doing? Hello, Daniel. Great, lovely to see you. Um, that was literally, that was just charming. <laughs> well done for holding it. <laughs> um, anyway, it's lovely to see you, Daniel. And uh, we've got so much to get through tonight. You've got such an impactful story to share. Um, but let's start off by offering you our Together Talks soapbox, if we may. Well, thank Go you ahead. so much, guys. Thank you. You know, last year I was standing uh, on the Rotary stage for the Rotary International Convention. And it was a huge honor. I think there was about 25,000 people in the room. This was back in the day when you could gather in a room from all around the world. And I remember standing on the stage saying that we were working on an idea, an idea that would take thank you from Australia to the world. And on my left and on my right were flags, flags from every nation uh, that represent where Rot Rotary uh, is represented and it was it was a really powerful visual because as I looked at those flags, I knew what we were building and we launched it uh, a few weeks ago. 
It was called No Small Plan. And No Small Plan is an invitation and it's a call out to the world to say, hey, we have an idea that's working in Australia and New Zealand. It's raised $17 million, but imagine if, imagine if this thing could be global today. And if it was, well, during the pandemic, we raised over $10 million of profits for our project partners around the world, but that's from two of the smallest countries on the planet. And if we were global, well, that would have been hundreds of millions of dollars. And so No Small Plan is a call out to 11 of the biggest product companies on the planet. They are in fact our competitors, but we've invited them uh, and invited one of them to make and distribute thank you product to the world. Uh, and when we launched a video calling out, people shared the video, people posted their support, media covered this story. And the simple call out to people was to use what's in your hand, your voice, your network, help spread the word. Now the campaigns had over 2.56 billion impressions, which blows our mind, but it's had over 740 media features. Uh, many just sitting in this room in our office, thanks to kind of the, the world of Zoom and digital, uh, you know, uh, stuff like this. But 740 media features in 35 countries getting the world out. And it showed us as an appetite for change at global scale. Now, we know the world needs it. Uh, we've put our hat in the ring. We've taken a bold step. We don't know who's in yet. We're talking with many companies, some who we invited, others who we didn't actually invite, but they said, hey, we could help too. And so we're yet to find out the result, but we hope this is the first of many, many, many bold actions um, and bold partnerships to flip business as usual uh, and help end extreme poverty and many other injustices too that exist today. So thank you for having me and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, Daniel, that, that's a mind-blowingly audacious goal and, you know, fair game. I, it, it, beautiful marriage of the power of giants um, married, coming together with the power of the individual action and how much that can yeah. accumulate. Um, we definitely want to come back and learn a bit more about where you are today. But before we do, yeah. can we ask you, for the sake of those that weren't with us in Hamburg at the convention, yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about the backstory of how you came to be and where you've been till now to get here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, for me, it started with a very simple moment. Uh, and, and it was, I mean, it was pretty small, but it grew. And, and, and most moments like this do. I, I was just in front of my computer doing some research uh, and I came across uh, some statistics around the world water crisis. The fact that four and a half thousand children uh, died uh, every day due to waterborne disease. Uh, and back in 2008, I was reading that 900 million people didn't have access to clean water. Now, these were pretty overwhelming statistics, but what really moved me, in fact, to the point that I was just sitting in front of my computer crying and I was moved to tears and kind of this uncomfortable feeling because I watched stories of children. You know, I got a son, Jed, who's five. You got to meet him, but I was reading about, you know, children as young as four who are walking to collect water for their family. Yeah. And yet it's that water that ends up, you know, killing brothers and sisters and, you know, that was never my reality. But the fact that it existed in our world made me so uncomfortable. Uh, Justine, uh, my co-founder and now wife, I mean, she had traveled to developing countries from the age of 12. So she'd seen it firsthand. <clears throat> in fact, she hadn't just traveled, she'd volunteered in communities uh, from that age too. And so I think for her and for me, we were moved by the, the darkness of extreme poverty, but then also this simple thought, Imagine if we could use the products that we buy every day to help right a wrong. And what's really interesting about the, the product choices we make is that collectively as humanity, we spend $53 trillion. So 50, sorry, I got that wrong. $63 trillion on consumer product, which is just hard to fathom, but it really speaks to like in the intro video, I said these two worlds, um, sorry, two extremes in this one world. So look, we were moved. Uh, a long story short, we had no idea what we're doing. We Googled how to start uh, you know, a product company. Our first product was water. We had no idea. And that was sort of the magic in it all. We would go into boardrooms and we'd ask things you're not meant to ask. And we'd pitch ideas you probably shouldn't pitch. But we discovered very quickly that you know, we weren't alone. Other people wanted to make change too. Uh, we set up Thank You as a social enterprise, a business that in our case is owned 100% by our charitable trust. 
that ownership's important. It means founders don't get equity. There are no investors. We're just like a charity, but we operate like uh, a business. And that all four model, it, it really set the tone for people from our, our manufacturing partners to retail partners to the movement of people behind this brand. I think what, what makes Thank You special isn't just <clears throat> the idea of thank you. It's this movement of people behind it. We love this quote that says a small group of determined and like-minded people can change the course of history. And that's thank you story. Uh, because to give you a quick example, I mean, we, we couldn't get this, this idea, this product into any major retailer in Australia. And we tried everything. We pitched, uh, you know, year after year. We found some cool little cafes that would stock our products, but none of the mainstream retailers would take us. And so then we launched a little video on YouTube and we said, hey, everybody, um, well, we've been going for a few years now and the big retailers haven't said yes. But two weeks from today, we booked a meeting with 7-Eleven Australia. For those who don't have a 7-Eleven in, in your country, it is a convenience chain. It's very popular in Australia. In fact, they're number one. And we asked people to jump onto the 7-Eleven Facebook wall and say, hey, 7-Eleven, if you stock thank you, I'd buy it. And people did. They sung, danced, and rapped. 7-Eleven said yes. And it kind of showed us people are powerful, which led to an even bigger moment. And I'll, I'll kind of finish on this, but it shows the power of people, a moment where um, we took on the two biggest supermarkets in our country. And we have two. They're called Coles and Woolworths. They have 70% market share. And... You know, if you're not in with them, you're barely a brand here. And after five years of them saying no, we launched a campaign called the Coles and Woolworths campaign. And one of my favorite moments was when in the media interview, someone, a reporter said, you, you know, you, you can't put the two biggest supermarkets who hate each other kind of in the same sentence. And my response was, oh, um, Wesley, our graphic designer, he didn't find it too hard. Um, and as, as stupid as that sounds, like that's kind of it. Brilliant. You know, you can't do something until you can. And, you know, people showed up, again, singing, dancing, rapping. Two helicopter pilots flew the helicopters for free around the head offices of Coles and Woolworths with these giant signs. Dear Coles, dear Woolworths, thank you for changing the world. In brackets, if you say yes, because we hadn't met them yet. They flew around for half an hour. And, look, it led to media covering it, and it led to Coles and Woolworths both saying yes. And today we have the number one hand wash. <clears throat> on shelf and it's a story of people and people power and that's i think what makes thank you really uh, unique and really special mm. amazing well daniel it's, it's an incredible story and i'm incredibly inspired uh, already um you mentioned your connection with justine you mentioned your shared passion for, for poverty and, and her experiences of it and and your research of it but I'd be really interested to know, kind of, what were you doing before this? What was your life leading up to this? Were you business-minded before? Was this kind of what you studied? Is this all kind of a learning experience as you go along? How did you lead into this, this whole thing? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I was, I was studying construction management uh, or project management in construction at university. I thought I wanted to make kind of buildings, um, and look, I probably picked the wrong course. I, I, I remember I turned up and there was a lecture on concrete. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a tough day. And then the, the lecturer, and I thought it was a joke, but the lecturer said, welcome to the semester of concrete. And it wasn't a joke. It's a whole semester on it. And like, I, I think I, I had this idea in my head about what it would be. And it wasn't really interesting me that much, but from like a young age, I was the kid. If you met me at school, I was probably trying to sell you something. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't really because I wanted to make money. I just thought, you know, why not? And I was selling whatever the trends were, um, you know, jawbreakers or gobstoppers, depending which country you're in. Um, I would sell them. I'd wash cars. I would sell cans of Coca-Cola. Um, just that was me. Um, I was really interested in business books and I think I was pretty convinced I wanted to get into business. And so I started probably at 18 and 19 following mentors and, you know, going to different business events and reading and, and it gave me a window into the world of money <laughs> and there's a lot of it. So that's something I, I kind of had my eyes open to. Um, 
you know, and it's really interesting because what thank you is, is it's this convergence of extreme poverty and extreme wealth and consumerism and, and the combination of the two. And I think what's interesting for, for Justine in her story, I mean, she was passionate about marketing people and culture, HR, business, and yet at the same time, she was so moved by her experiences. Um, you know, and I should have mentioned, she didn't just travel. She'd save up the money from bake sales. And it's, it's an incredible story. She'd save up the money, like when she was like 12 and 14, her mum would make her earn it herself. She, her mum would help. But it was this really great lesson on, you know, investing and time. She got to see a little bit of the fruit of her work but it's led to a really, you know, impactful organization, which for both of us is, you know, it's something we're passionate about, but it's also for a purpose that, you know, and, and, and an injustice that we think needs to be made right. Yeah, fantastic. And then, and then just finally, who came up with the name and, and what does it mean to you, the, the brand name? Thank you. I mean, the, <laughs> the best way I can describe it is I... At this one moment, just thinking about what is this thing called? This thing that was that was about product and consumer and 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 I I remember closing my eyes and I, I feel like I just saw the word thank you. Mm-hmm. And I know this sounds strange, but I, I I jumped on my computer and I wrote out this word thank you, one word full stop. And it was just mesmerizing. I was like, could you call a brand that? No, yes, why not? No, you could trade, how, how would it work? And this sort of like, you know, and then, and then we learn about companies like Apple and Facebook and they're pretty common names and they work. And I learned like the whole trademarking thing's not super complicated. You just literally, if no one's ever put a TM next to the word, you just put the TM there yourself. <laughs> and that doesn't mean it's technically registered yet, but you're indicating to the world you want to register it. And then years later you can, well, we got there um, in, you know, in our country and, and others, and it, that was a journey. But I think to me, it means gratitude. It, it, it's like this, this idea of like gratitude is what, what we stand for, what we think is a radical concept, um, certainly in a more and more divided world. <clears throat> and we love this thought that this is not a movement built on guilt and shame and the darkness, but it's built on hope. And on light, you know, and gratitude fits in with that. And the word thank you seems to, it just, it sticks. It's amazing, you know, to, to hear your story about how in purpose-driven you and Justine were from such a young age. And I think inspiration comes when you're purpose-driven, Daniel. And, you know, to be, to have such a sense of drive is amazing. I, I know that uh, you mentioned in your intro video and in your soapbox that there's been some lessons learned along the way. <laughs> Not always easy. It's never a straight line for any entrepreneurs. And uh, you shared a story in Hambo, which I'll never forget about how you had to get to the next second chapter. And you, the innovative idea of this book can you just tell yeah. us a little bit about that one? <laughs> yeah, well, I did. <clears throat> and actually, people were very generous in, in Hamburg and bought a lot of copies of Chapter One. Um, but for those who don't know, this book was a simple idea. Thank You has kind of a technical flaw to the model. And that is, I mean, we don't have investors, we don't have shareholders. So it's kind of hard to get money and cash to scale the idea quickly, to take it to new countries, into new categories. And so... We had this idea, what if we threw it to the movement? What if we asked people to use what's in their hand? And so we wrote chapter one. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. It's getting late here. My voice is fading for some reason. But chapter one is the first chapter of the thank you story. And 100% of the profit from chapter one would fund chapter two, the future. And so we launched the book uh, in retail stores here in Australia and New Zealand at a pay what you want price. So no retail price. Now, this blew the minds of the retailers. Um, but pay what you want to us is, a, is really a question to the world. How much do you want to invest into the future of an idea that we think could change it? Um, you know, never, as, as far as I know, has a reader of a book also played the role of the, the kind of the social investor in the future of it. Certainly not at this scale. And we love the thought that every reader was a social investor in future chapters. And when we launched it for context in our country, a best-selling book is 5,000 copies. 
In fact, New York Times bestsellers 5,000 copies a week for three weeks. I didn't know that, but that's sort of, you know, books don't sell a whole lot anymore. And, and they say you'd be lucky to make about $50,000 profit. Well, in the first uh, two hours from chapter one sales, we raised $360,000. In the first 28 days, 1.44 million. Today, over 2.5 million raised. And <clears throat> the most paid, or actually the least paid, people have paid five and 10 cents, which is you know, <clears throat> good luck on the currency conversion, wherever you're coming from, but it's like nothing. Uh, and, and, and then, but then there's stories like Landon, who was 12 when he started buying copies of this book, he'd pay $20 with his pocket money. And his mum wrote to us saying he's bought four books. Then she updated, he'd bought 18 copies. And we love Landon's story, but at the other end, uh, another lady paid $50,000 for one copy and pay what you want worked. I mean, people went all in and the whole book is around challenging the world, challenging convention. In fact, when you open it, it appears to be printed the wrong way. And uh, we changed it. And, and in our research, there was no best-selling book written in this format. And, and so we thought, oh, that, that's a cool idea. Let, let, let's flip it. And we flipped it for two reasons. One, if you read a normal book in public, that's invisible. But if you read that book kind of sideways, all of a sudden people are looking at you thinking, what is that about? And that leads to really the most important reason. We wrote this to make you, the reader, feel uncomfortable because we've realized that to make change, make ideas a reality, you have to get uncomfortable and you have to kind of step out. And look, people loved it. One guy was like, this is genius. Like you guys are absolute, how did you do it? How did you do this? And I was telling him, well, we just hit rotate. Um, on the print file, like, that's it. You know, that's all we did. And it kind of shows you like, it's sort of not too hard to change the world. And yet at the same time it is, but therein lies a really, uh, I think a really powerful concept of just pushing boundaries and getting out of our, our comfort zone. So innovative. It's absolutely, I love that story. So Daniel, that took you to chapter two and you're still yeah. growing the company, but you were really still trying to go it alone. And now with no small plan, it seems you're into partnering now. Tell us a little bit about the shift there for you guys. Yeah, look, I mean, the partnership model is bold, but it comes from a pretty deep and personal place, to be honest. I mean, after over a decade of this, um, it was amazing. I mean, doors opened, the books sold, you know, we were, we were busy. Um, in fact, that these books sort of, found us speaking in forums and rooms all around the world. And it, it was, it was a great thing, but I think we ultimately after over a decade of this nearly burnt out both Justine and I in different ways. She had a few months off. I did too. And it was in that time that it was, you know, incredibly humbling and realizing like, ah, you know, are we failures? Are we not good enough? And I, um, I remember reading a book during that time and, and this book talked about a, a leader who'd gone through burnout and he talked about this idea of what's your 5%. Now, at first I didn't think too much about it, but he proposed that as a leader, um, you know, 85% of what you do, someone else could do. Most leaders don't admit to that. They just want to do it themselves. Uh, 10%, someone highly trained or who you apprentice could do that. And that leaves 5%. And it's, it's the 5% that only you can do. It's the stuff you're born for. And as both Jesse and I read this at different times, our minds both went to, oh yeah, okay, I know what my five is. And then we read his, which was super confronting. He said like, his 5% is like sleep. He can't outsource that. No one can sleep for him. Uh, his relationships with his wife and his kids and his faith and his health. And I would like, feeling very like ugh, uncomfortable reading it and he kind of goes through all of that and then he has a little bit left for what he can give to his organization and vision and mission that he's on he kind of proposes that for so many of us we can end up burning out because we we tap too deep into that 85 into that 95 percent and it eats away at the things that matter most it leads to burnout and you know if left unchecked some really destructive stuff in family and health and your body. And we, we had a real, real like personal check on that. And then we looked at the business we looked at thank you. And we're like, wow, man, we've been trying to live as a hundred percent. 
you know what I mean? Like we're all for the mission, great, but we're doing things that other people could do. In fact, that other people do really well. And it made us rethink who we are and discover what's our 5% at thank you, which was a really humbling journey. We had to acknowledge, okay, yeah, we have been proud. We have thought we could do it all ourselves. But what does that look like to realize that, yes, there's some things that only we can do, but there are many others who've got that also. And what if we came together? And no small plan is sort of the, the culmination of our deep journey of to see radical change at global scale. It takes all of us. And so we have to unite and we have to find ways to work together. And this proposal, it's not simple. You know, in the last few weeks of meetings and negotiations have shown that, in fact, we're in the middle right now. So if you're listening to this, it's not finished. We don't know. We don't know the result. We know what we've proposed. We've our hearts have been warm to see a really positive uptake from many potential partners, but it's very clear we are asking people to do something that maybe they haven't done before. We are asking people to do something. And sorry, guys, I can, I can see I've dropped out. I think I'm still here. But we're asking people to do something that, you know, is, you know, it's just a new box for them to tick. Yeah. But I think we all need to do that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we've still got you, don't worry. <laughs> so we have to ask you this, Daniel. I think it was 2017, you were selected alongside three other social entrepreneurs to sit down and meet the President Barack Obama to discuss social change and motivation. How was it? How did it go? And uh, are you still thinking about it today? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, it was very unexpected. Uh, I had no warning. At, uh, uh, had an invitation to attend the global, uh, uh, I think it was the inaugural Obama Foundation su Summit, which I thought, well, that, that's cool. Um, you know, the, the Obamas, uh, Michelle and Barack were launching, kind of all relaunching their foundation. And I thought, look, Chicago is a long way to go for this, but, you know, it, it'd be really unique. And I kind of went and got there <clears throat> and again, had no context for what was about to happen. I thought I was just going to sit in the audience uh, and, and mind my own business. And then two event organizers came up and they sort of said, are you Daniel Flynn? I said, yes. They said, you, you didn't get back to our email. And I said, I have been traveling. I don't even know what day it is. And they <laughs> said, well, you're, um, so that in the email, um, President Obama has selected you. Um, there was a short list. Uh, you didn't know about it, but you've been selected for an interview tomorrow on the live stream. Are you up for it? <laughs> and naturally, you don't say no to something like that. And I think the three of us, we found ourselves all nervous, all just, you know, beforehand just thinking. And, and it was made worse by the, se the Secret Service. So America is America. Like the, they come in and they lock the room down. And it was like the, it was like the actual movies. And so they, they locked the room down. We must have seen a dozen of these secret service, but then one of them, and we're all on stools. Imagine how nervous we are. One of them starts counting down hundred feet, 80 feet. And we're just looking at him like, and then the doors open and in comes this entourage. And the interesting moment is the moment he met us and we met him. It was just so human and natural. And if you followed his story, he's just, an incredible communicator, but made us all feel very, very comfortable. He knew everyone's name, which I'm sure he gets a briefing, but it just, it felt so, you know, just speechless. You know, I, I was pretty nervous. I, he asked me how I was doing. I said, good. I, I said to him, I said, I hope you're not nervous for the interview. <laughs> and he's like, I'm not nervous. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> and then we sat down and, um, and, and he asked some really interesting questions of all of us. Um, one of them for thank you that was memorable. He said, when's thank you coming, you know, to the world? He said, markets are global now. And I just remember sitting there saying, well, we're about to launch into New Zealand. And, you know, after that, we look forward to taking this further. But it was just such a surreal moment because he was right. Markets are global. And I think there's an appetite for us to be global citizens and to create global change and I think that's the great call to all of us. And certainly their foundation is all about shining the light on change and just helping it go further. So 
Daniel, this is so hard because we always have so much to pack into such a short time. But let's move on to let's get back to your mission and your purpose of uh, ending poverty. There was an incredible article in The Economist at the end of September, um, very compelling article entitled COVID-19 has reversed years of gains in the war on poverty. Yeah. They're saying literally it's almost set us back a decade because, mm -hmm. of course, everyone's impacted. It doesn't treat people the same. You know, the, the rich can shrug off the economic impact and the poor definitely cannot. And, and in fact, the United Nations said that the poor the definition of poor is, you know, in terms of people without basic shelter or who can go hungry, it will swell 240 million to 490 million this year. So what, you know, tell us a little bit more about how do you get, how are you getting everyone to buy into their ability to impact that, you know, and with this campaign? Where yeah, and, and this this is the challenge because that number to every one of us listening is so uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable because it's just wrong. It, it is it is so wrong and it moves us because I think we can all, you know, through maybe personal experience or through stories or videos we've watched, we can all imagine the life of one family and the impact that would be. You know, there was a report that came out uh, by Brack. Uh, in Bangladesh a few months back and I remember reading it and as I'm reading it and it was weeks old by the time I read it but it said four out of ten respondents had two days food left and I'm thinking two days food left in the cupboard I'm reading this weeks later what does this live like like to live out and if anyone wants to wonder skip a couple of meals I, mean, I just, just like it is it is just a like hunger this stuff is brutal and and so I think it's overwhelming. The numbers are so big, but I think there's only one way and it's change at scale. Now let's go. Now, is everyone up for it? Not sure. I mean, you know, the, everyone's confused to be honest. I mean, one company, you know, we met and spoke to, and again, this is normal business, but they spoke about that they need to focus just on make, pack and send. You know, we just got to make, pack and send what we've got. We've really got to just look after the business because we're in a pandemic and I'm thinking, wow, we, mm, no. Nah. You know, and, and I get it. I mean, the world has operated in one way for a very, very long time. But I think what we cannot underestimate as citizens and as individuals is that we think our voice doesn't count or it's, it's not that significant. But every single movement that's ever existed is simply when the majority kind of below wake up to this has got to change. And it's that collective voice, the collective choice that fundamentally flips systems. And we all think, but if only the billionaire at the top or the decision maker at the top of the company, look, to be honest, the way that their worlds work, they actually need the pressure of the majority at the bottom. In our case, it's the consumer. In other cases, you, and so that's the power of the petition. It's the power of your choice. And thank you is small choices that collectively equal big change. Um, I think that's all that any movement ever is. And so our, our kind of worldview right now is like, we need bold change at scale now. But what is that? Micro actions. Let's go and combine them and then let's let's flip some systems. Well, Daniel, as you already know, Rotarians love a challenge and we hope that we've got non-Rotarians joining us um, in this event as well. And hopefully they'll feel inspired to that call to action. And right, Luke? <laughs> Absolutely. Of course. So just one, one last question for me, Daniel, is do you have any plans to launch in the UK? What is your relationship with the UK market right now? Look, we, we absolutely do. I mean, we've always seen Thank You as a global product for global consumers helping end global poverty. So the UK fits within that. Um, and, and, and so right now, our goal is how do we get the right manufacturing partners? Um, because it's one thing to sort of pop up, but it's another thing to be built to last. So no small plan is about really getting the back end strong so that when we turn up in the UK, this is not a fly-by-night story. Uh, but the next step, as soon as we've locked that in, is to lock in retail partners. And we've already spoken to uh, a few. And, and look, people seem interested, but that's the next step, retail partnerships. And then the most important step is the people, us, you, everyone to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll buy that hand wash or 
I'll buy that sanitizer. And our goal is to make a product that's better than the competition so that you buy it just because you like the fragrance, you love the packaging, but really deep down you commit to it because this is here to flip a system on its head and right or wrong. So, you know, UK watch this space, Mm -hmm. but we've got some work in front of us. So Daniel, I'm afraid we're out of time, Um, but it's such powerful information and it's so inspiring. Uh, Such original approaches to such an age old problem and taking on something as big as poverty certainly isn't easy. And we've got so much admiration for everything you're doing, you and your team. Uh, thank you uh, for tackling that and for communicating your approach so effectively and giving us the chance to play along. That's just mm-hmm. a wonderful concept. So at this point, can I ask you to share your three key takeaways? Because this is a call to action. That's what that's what Together Talks is about. So what are those yeah. three takeaways, please? My head straight away goes to personal. It, it's like takeaway number one is like for each of us, let's figure out what our 5% is. That's at a personal level, that's at an organizational level and figuring out your 5% is so powerful because then it's about partnering with others, which is takeaway point number two, partnership. Partner with people, teams, don't reinvent wheels. Don't point around how someone's like, well, see how they're doing it, we're gonna do it better. I think that's gotta stop, right? And we've gotta stop building silos and we have to partner together. So figure out your 5% one, partnerships at scale now. And the final point is, Small steps equal big change. For example, anyone who's backed our campaign and if people still want to share the video and jump online and look at our stuff, that's a small action. It's going to equal big change. But there are so, so many examples. And, and, and if we could all wake up to that, I think individually we will live very, very impactful lives and together we'll change you know, systems and the world. So thank you. Daniel, thanks for talking to us, not just about your organization, your aims and what you're doing, but for, uh, you know, welcoming us to you as, as a person, inviting us into your home and, and even letting us meet your family as well. You're, you're, you're <laughs> super awesome. And I hope that this will lead to some further collaboration between what you're doing and Rotary. we will be really, really awesome. keen to push that. So just once again, a huge thank you for thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys that point we have to say goodbye daniel so thank you so much i'm out all right guys yeah. please do take some time to look into the work that daniel's doing you can visit the thank you website at www.thankyou.co and that video that uh, daniel just mentioned is is a real wow have a look at the campaign and uh, see however you can get involved and let's not forget that today is giving tuesday so if you've not had a chance to consider making a donation yet in some form or another it's worthy of note that our rotary foundation is one of the top rated charities in the world and we can get involved in changing the world a lot more with leveraging our own money and of course there's also the campaign to eradicate polio as discussed with michelle zafran here on together talks back on october 20th Thank you, Nikki. And so uh, in two weeks from Poverty to Peace, we have two very special guests joining us next week, Lauren Cafaro and Wisdom Addo. There is so much to say about these two, from their adventures as Rotary Global Peace Scholars to their own fantastic life stories. And we'll be hearing those, of course, but mostly we'll be hearing about the fantastic fantastic work that they both do with Peace Jam. Peace Jam is a global peace education organization that works with young people and Nobel Peace Laureates and engaging youth in peace through conferences, curriculums and events and service learning projects all over the world. Lauren is Peace Jam's Director of Global Programs and Wisdom is the Executive Director, West Africa Center for Peace Foundation. And he also runs Peace Jam in Ghana. And of course, our very own Luke is the Peace Jam Europe Conference Coordinator. So kudos to you, uh, Luke, and all that great work you did. And they just held their first pan-European online peace conference a few weeks ago. I'm sure we'll hear more about it next time. Be sure not to miss that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. And now let us, as always, uh, end by thanking you, our audience, for being with us tonight and asking a uh, great questions and for joining us uh, for the talk. We'd like to remind you that the whole broadcast along with the series so far will be uh, streamed on YouTube, can be found by searching Rotary in Great Britain and Ireland and Together Talks on the YouTube page 
where we'd like to invite you to like, subscribe and share. And until then, it's good night for me. And a good night for me. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye.